Hello fellas, welcome back to a brand new video. I've came to see Steve at Auto Bionics. I've been to see Steve's project a few times now and it's absolutely incredible, especially modern day stuff like everyone's into the, the retro modified, like uh, retro, retro mod, like modernizing cars. And that's what Steve's done here. This, Steve started out by buying this white Sierra three-door Cosworth. And your plan was, mate, to put a twin-turbo V6 Raptor engine in. Yeah, I think, um, you know, going even a step back, I built so many cars for different people. Mm -hmm. it, was, um, it was a sunny afternoon one day. I was just sat outside having a, having a brew, thinking it's about time I built something for myself. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, what, you know, what would it be? And I had a three-door Cosworth back in... Um, Oh, eight, late 80s. Mm -hmm. built, built one off a shelf, believe it or not, back then. So it's like deja vu, and I've always hankered after getting uh, another one. So I thought, well, what would I do with it now with a modern day twist, having like 30 odd years of experience of building cars with different powertrains in and all that type of stuff. So that's kind of what sowed the seed. So I thought I'd build a three door Cosy because I love the shape of them, mm -hmm. and, and I'd put a modern day powertrain in. It had to be a Ford powertrain, couldn't mm -hmm. put anything else in. You know, I've done a lot of cars with the American V8s in and, you know, modern day fuel injected V8s, uh, different gearbox packages. But, you know, if you keep that lineage back, it's got to be Ford. So building a, a three door, modern day three door Cosworth with a latest Ford engine. And everybody was thinking about me, thinking about putting a V8 in. And I think, no, these cars don't want the V8 in. Um, so the next option was the V6, and the V6, the highest output V6 that Ford made, uh, Ford still do make, is the uh, the three and a half liter twin turbo. Is that what you look for? The highest output, the highest. Pretty grip? much so, yeah, yeah. Um, and that um, that engine um, is fitted in a lot of cars in in the US, in the states, you know, even in Lincoln Navigators and stuff like that. But Ford did a Raptor, F one fifty truck Raptor, which was theirs kind of like high output um, version of this. So that was the engine I chose. So I thought, well, that's the engine. What do I need to do now from a transmission point of view? Didn't want to go manual. A lot of people say, well, they, you know, keep the manuals, make the manuals live on and all that type mm -hmm. of stuff. But because obviously these were all manual, manual cars. cars. Yeah, but because I'd done so many other things with Porsche PDK gearboxes in particular, I wanted to go seven speed DCT dual clutch transmission because I can see the benefits of them in shift times and um, everything's programmable, everything's kind of um, configurable. So that's when I thought, well, gearbox wise, I'll go with the seven speed DCT out of a car. Didn't know which one to put in at that point. Anyway, to cut a long story short, I settled on the uh, seven speed DCT that came out of the M3, the right. V8 M3, so that's the E90 series. And the reason for that is it's a, it's a strong gearbox, good for torque, good ratios, etc. So engine and powertrain, or the powertrain as it is now, so it's V6 twin turbo um, EcoBoost, three and a half litre EcoBoost with a seven speed DCT. So car was nailed on, you know, I decided that's the car, decided that's the powertrain. Um, what do I do and how do I get to, you know, where I needed to be? So I bought this three-door cosy thinking it's a project car you know buy it take it apart fit the engine fit the gearbox and rebuild it and that was the original concept and then i think on some of the other, other videos what we've we've done i saw that i found a brand new body shell mm -hmm. which i was offered um, at the time when i was looking for parts believe it or not yeah the project shifted gears a little bit then so i, I looked at building a brand new car basically from, from the ground up. And then maybe using this car as like the, um, the, the mock-up mule the to do mule. all the powertrain development um, so that I didn't have to fit it into a brand new shell. But time ticks on. I think we, you know, we had COVID in between and mm -hmm. this, that and the other, and I had a few things I had to do with the business. So the timeline just grew mm -hmm. and the concept then changed to a point where as I just used this car just to develop all of the hardware to fix that engine and gearbox into it. Another thing, you didn't want to modify the shell at all, did you? You didn't want to put new gearbox tunnels in. Correct, yeah. You didn't want to move on any of the turrets. Yeah. So really you're making a kit that would fit in any cause without there, any three door cause without there. Yeah, and I, I, you know, I don't know why I, I wanted to go that route because 
would it have been any easier? I don't think it would have been because there's there's a few things where you found those there's EcoBoost engine. There's another one there. That's Quite, the same kind of engine what you're putting in, isn't it? Yeah, so that's a second engine that, like I said, I, I got hold of because yeah, it's funny th things come and fall in your lap every now and again, and um, because people can see what I'm doing. I get, um, I get offered quite a few bits and pieces mm -hmm. as well. Anyway, I got offered this. It's another brand new engine. And I thought, well, what do we need that for? Um, I thought, well, it's always nice to have a spare, mm -hmm. you know? But um, I can also get a lot of information from a running engine as well to then start to build the, um, the control system for these engines because nobody runs these engines standalone. You know, it's very difficult to get them to run standalone outside of an original platform. So um, this is actually running on a, on a standalone Ford engine management system. Is that um, what we've got here then? Yeah, that's the standard Raptor ECU, engine ECU. Is this uh, a Sierra Cause with radiator? It is, yeah, running. it's actually out of this white car. Yeah, but it's just to, it's just to get it running. Uh -huh. um, and then I've actually proved that I can get this running as a standalone because it becomes a saleable item then as well. Mm -hmm. um, but also I can get a lot of information off of the, what they call the CAN bus which is a communications network that, that ECUs or all modern day electronics use. And they use those, that CAN data then to, um, to help build the calibration file for the new engine and the new engine management system that I'm going to use in that car. So there's lots of things that um, is interesting to know because it's got variable valve timing on all four cams. Um, you can see what kind of trigger pattern it's, it's got and the angles between uh, crank and camshaft so you can build all those things into your your startup calibration to get the engine running and then you can use that information then to start tweaking the fuel um, the fuel tables and the ignition tables because these engines run um, port injection and direct injection right um, they predominantly run on direct injection but when uh, it needs uh, more horsepower on demand, it, it opens the port injection as well. So how many injectors has this engine got? Uh, it's 12. 12? Yeah. So two injectors per cylinder? Yeah. Yeah, one into the cylinder and one into the port. Yeah. So this was the plot to put a 3 litre V6 yes. in this with the BMW gearbox. Yeah. Um, and you were going to test this, you were going to build it up and use this as a test mule. Correct. You were going to get this running and driving. That, that's, that was the plan. Original yeah. plan, the but original plans plan. change. They, they have, yeah. I have enough confidence now with the work that I've done mechanically mm -hmm. and electrically that I can just build it straight into that shell now to start with. Um, so all of the uh, adapter kit between engine and gearbox, because that gearbox was never meant to mate against the back of that engine. So all of that's been designed um, and it's all fitted on, on that car now. Can we have a look at this car? Of course, yeah, you, you sure. did actually buy a brand new shell, didn't you? I did, yeah. So it's obviously been painted now. The lads at uh, FC Paint Shop done it. They did, yeah. Incredible they, job. They did an amazing job, yeah. So a big shout out to those guys. Absolutely phenomenal, you know, quality. You know, the car had been stood for 30 odd years. It was still all in the original Ford Primer, but it was all taken back to bare metal because you never know how much moisture has been sort of What's absorbed under the in the paint and all that type of stuff. So speaking to Scott at the FC, um, he, he said, look, let's take it right back to bare metal. So top side, underside, everything was taken back. And then it was just all, the paint system they use was just all the same right from bare metal up to obviously the lacquer. But it just seems to be aging a lot better as well. You were seeing it when you first got the car, kind of looked. I think it's because it didn't have any furniture on the uh -huh. car. It just looked really shiny. Uh -huh. um, but when you actually start to put some contrasting colours against it and obviously put spoilers on and wing mirrors Pumpers and glass in and stuff. It just starts to take a bit of that shine off it, but it makes it, mm. I don't know, it just makes it more mature. Mate, you know? This is an absolutely beautiful car. Absolutely yeah. beautiful. So you've got, as opposed, that's a three-door Cosworth. This yeah. is an RS500 like style. You've got the bumpers, yes. you've got the fog light grills. Yes, yeah, so... Um, Re-spoiler, you've got the re-spoilers? Yeah, so there's a... There's the boot lid spoiler there, look, the, the rubber on top of the top three of the door. Three door. Um, it's got the RS500 rear uh, Oh, rear the spoiler. spoiler's on. Yeah, with a gurney flap on the back, mm -hmm. obviously. Um, so it will be RS500 looking, um, which is why it's called an RSR500, and the, mm -hmm. uh, the extra R's for the Raptor, because um, that's where the engine came from. 
but you know it's 500 because it's easy 500 horsepower easy and i don't want any more to be honest with you i don't go shooting for the moon on horsepower figures it's just something that's got enough shove and enough grunt seven speed dct but it's it's tractable drivable it's got a lot of compliance in the drivetrain and it's just be a nice car to drive you know that's so, kind of the plan so you've got the engine in um have yes. you got the gearbox in? Yeah, gearbox. We can shift, we can lift this car up at look. some point if you want and have a look. But yeah, um, the mock-up gearbox is still on this car because what I wanted to do, well, it's at the stage now that all of the hardware to get the engine mounted, so there's a new cross beam, cross member being fabricated. And the reason for that is, like I said earlier, these engines are tall and to get this to fit, you can't lift them too too high up because the the foul on the, on the bonnet. Mm -hmm. And you can't put them too far down because they had a massive sump pan on them. Mm -hmm. You've got to remember, these came out of a truck. So the ground clearance was no problem, mm -hmm. you know, to them. So I've had to squeeze it down in this way. Um, obviously, couldn't do anything at the top, but on the side, I had to design my own uh, oil pan. So when we get underneath, you'll see that's all been made out of billet aluminium, hard anodized, and it's a winged, a winged system with a pickup and stuff in there. But that was just to keep the oil volu volume but to reduce the depth so I could put the engine in the most optimum place and what I found then is to get the angle or the pitch of the engine right with the DCT on the back I didn't have to modify any of the tunnel and I could get the angle to the um, diff input shaft absolutely spot on perfect um, and it fit actually really really well in the end it's probably if anything it's a bit low a the bit engine low. Yeah, if I, I'd like to maybe half an inch higher, mm -hmm. but I'm not going to worry too much no. about that. So hardware-wise, like I say, engine mounts, and again, we'll have a look underneath because it's easy to see underneath. But the billet engine plates, billet sus uh, engine suspension parts um, on a new cross beam that hasn't, hasn't been powder coated yet because there's just a few other little mods I just want to do first on it. Um, and it's now at the stage where I want to fit everything on the car that has an electrical connector. Right. Because the next stage is to start building the, um, the electrical harnesses. And there's gonna be three discrete harnesses on the car. There's gonna be the body control, so that's lights, everything. Heaters, indicators, Heat, stuff Indicators, like that. everything like that, even interior lights and in-car entertainment stuff and all that type of thing. And that'll be off a single, a single harness. Um, but I'll use um, a PDM system rather than a fuse box and relays. So it'll be all be electronic, solid state control. And the reason for that is everything's configurable, mm -hmm. everything then. So you can, you can interface and you can put you know, logic in there that things can't come on until something else is being done or that type of stuff. You can put timers on lights to come on when you unlock the doors, all that type of stuff, Mo like modern day stuff. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm gonna go PDM. Um, and then the, the second discrete harness will be the powertrain control. So there'll be a dedicated harness for the engine and gearbox, which will just pick up things like power supplies, so permanent supplies and, and, uh, and switched supplies. And then the third discrete system will be the uh, ABS, which is also part of the traction control as well. Mm -hmm. So those are the bits that I need to start wiring. Um, and that's why I need to put all the small component parts on that's got a connector, um, you know, or needs power or signal or whatever that is. So that's why lights are on and I'd like say sensors are going in air boxes and, in, and into duct work and things like wheel speed sensors. I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll come onto the wheels in a minute, but um, there's all that type of stuff still to do. So it's starting to look kind of car, but there's a Lot of bunch of work still to do. And and work, yeah. I mean, we've mentioned the paintwork being amazing, but everything pretty much is NOS parts, new old stock, so you've got new glass, yeah, yeah. splitters, headlights. Yeah. Yes. What I've found, I spend most of my time looking for parts. It's Dear, you spare you, time. You get, um, how can I put it, it's, it's kind of, I don't know, it's a bit like a... Is that open? No, it'll open, it's just dark. I'm being, ge I'm no, being right. gentle. Wants, uh, but... You, I don't know what it is, is it? when you get to this stage, you don't want to be putting old parts on your car. Just your old parts. But there are parts you have to do, you've got to put, um, because you just can't find them. Mm -hmm. Because they're so obsolete now, or in such a poor condition, 
And just recently, I've just done the weep, weep, wiper mechanism. I noticed that on the, on the Facebook yeah, page. Yeah, so again, but it's, it's refurbished, but you know, all new bushes in there, everything's been re-electroplated. It takes time. You know, if you can find a NOS part and you can fit it, it's obviously saves time. Time, time is money. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, some things you have to do. But, you know, all the doors have been built up now. So everything's NOS. So door locks are NOS. Uh, oh, really? Solenoids are NOS. Yeah, yeah. All of door openings, you know, so every, all these clips are NOS. Where do you get the majority of the parts? Just looking on Facebook or do you go yeah, to... Yeah, pretty much so. Um, but it's, it's the silly things that are so difficult to find. Like, I got a spare set of doors. Um, and I thought full I'll, doors? Metal yeah, doors. Full, full doors. I thought I'll just strip them and I'll just use the parts into these shells because they're obviously a brand new shell uh, that was just empty. Mm -hmm. But when you start to take old stuff apart, it's still in really poor mm -hmm. condition. Well, the th how old yeah. are the cars? 36, well, exactly. 37? And the things like, you know, little wheels that fit on the uh, window tracks. Uh -huh. So trying to find them, because the, the, one of them had a flat one on the bottom of it, because it's obviously not being greased very well. So it wasn't turning. Because it wasn't turning. And I was like, anyway, to cut a long story short, I ended up paying like 30 quid for a plastic wheel. And Did it came you? from Italy or somewhere <laughs> like that, you know. But that's the kind of stuff you've got to do. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But, um, you know, it's... Um, yeah, it's just a, it's a bit of a passion. It, it turns into a bit of a passion when you Mate. start to start searching for parts and you, you end up having to go that extra mile just to not put a refurbished part on, but there are parts that you have to... Have to refurbish. You have to refurbish, yeah, you know. Um, but, you know, locks are brand new, handles are new, weather seals around glass are new, glass is new. These are hard to get as well, mine. These wind, these yeah, really I was really window fortunate dreams. to find them. And, you know, obviously, you, you know, I've got quite a few bits off Paul at uh, Paul, Paul in Racing. Racing. And, um, you know, fortunately enough, I was in the right place at the right time and I managed to snag them from him. Mm -hmm. um, but I wouldn't mind a set of these for my car. Yeah, they, they are very, very difficult to find, mm -hmm. you know, in a new condition. Because uh, they, when they've been in and out of a car a few times, they just bend over the they they metal. They're so in difficult to kind of keep straight. Um, but yeah, they're in there for now, and hopefully for the <laughs> not for the last again. time. So, so one thing you haven't refurbished is the rear beam as well. You've gone with Eggenberger Group Beer Two. And yeah, and that's that's a bit of a uh, how can I put it? Uh, I don't know. Maybe a bit overkill, but there's a, there is some method in my madness. I originally was going to go with standard uh, rear setup. Mm -hmm. um, a standard rear beam. A standard rear beam. Now. I always had a, um, an issue with the width of tyre because as all Cosworth owners will know, you're always struggling to get wide, wide, wide tires. rubber under there. A lot of cars have the arches cut so they can get that extra mm -hmm. sort of like inch and a quarter. Mine are cut. Um, but I didn't want to do that. Mm -hmm. And then the, the reason they struggle to get width is the rear trailing arms then stop you getting width on the inside of the car and on the inside of the wheel. So I made a set of 17 inch wheels for, for this car um, and I was going to use them. Mm -hmm. I kept them at seven inch. I did design an eight inch rim, but then you struggle to get a tire. Um, you know, well, you could put the same tire on a seven inch than you could on an eight inch. So it didn't really benefit because I didn't want to cut arches and all that type of stuff, like I say. Now with this setup, what it allows you to do is it allows you to position the wheel anywhere in the arch. So I could change the offset to get the sort of like track width, whatever I want. I can change, you know, the position fore and aft by altering you know, where the toe links are and where it attaches to the beam. So I can actually put the wheel in the centre of the arch because three door causes and in fact some stuff. The uh, wheel never sit right uh, in the arch. So when you lower them, they kind of yeah. they move in the arch, don't they? Exactly. Um, so I can position the wheel exactly in the arch and I can also get extra width on the inside. So now I can, I think after scanning, um, they're doing some laser scan work and I've actually got the new wheel in 3D model center lock. I think I can get a nine inch rim on there now, um, which will get a nice wide tire, 235. Maybe 235 tire? 245 maybe. And again, the reason for that is, you know, this engine produces so much torque. Um, mm -hmm. 
It's, what kind of torque does it produce, standard? Oh, it's, it's over 500 foot pounds of torque, yeah. And these were notorious for being able to pull jumbo jets and stuff like that. Really? Yeah, yeah, there were, there's, <laughs> there's loads of, when the F-150 came out, there were, it, they did the promotional thing, that's probably the biggest torqueiest engine that Ford had produced anyway. So I know it's got a load of torque, but the good thing is I need to get some fat, because I think it looks better as well, you know, with a decent set of rubber under the back but I can control how much torque goes to the rear axle by having the traction control on by using Cybex ECU and using modern day electronics to not turn horsepower and torque into blue smoke. I can, mm -hmm. I can control it. And the good thing about that as well is I can do several different drive modes. So I can be fully auto, it can be manual, so you can use the paddles. Uh, and then you can have like sport mode and sport plus mode so you can change the ferocity of the shifts but you can also change the the torque characteristics coming to the rear axle mm -hmm. as well so you can like increase throttle opening speeds and stuff like that so it gets more responsive um, but fundamentally you can stop the wheels from spinning mm -hmm. you know by using the four wheel speed sensors which control the abs but also go into the uh, ecu and you and they use the same sensor to then do the torque management as well for the powertrain. So that's why I went this setup to get wider tires on, being able to position the wheels. And the other thing is, it's the ultimate setup to get that perfect handling um, in a road car as well. You know, the dampers on this, they'll need revalving because they'll be too well, stiff. Have you got a group of dampers? Yeah, they're the Bilstein ones, but that's why there's no springs on at the moment as well, because I need to get the spring rates worked out. Mm -hmm. But the dampers, I need to get the dampers, need to get the dampers so I can get things like the ride height sorted. Um, and then I'll just, um, like I say, I'll just revalve them. I'll get them revalved. Same with the fronts, so that they're a bit more compliant for the road. Are you going group wheel set up on the front as well? Yeah. There Is that are, it there? Can we have a look? That's some there, yeah. So these are the front, front just... uprights. Now, the, the reason I haven't put these on yet, because those are the tops. They, they fit on, on top of there, basically. And then those go into the turrets. So you're going to have to cut the strut tops for those? Well, you're going to have to drill them. No, I didn't want to drill them. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to have to do that, I think. Right. And the reason, there's two reasons why I'm, I procrastinate. That's my biggest, one of my biggest problems. I'll just sit and look at stuff for hours without before doing anything. But I'll drill this, but I'll, I'm also going to fit a, um, a strut brace on it as well. Mm -hmm. Because again, with that amount of horsepower and torque, I want to stiffen the shell up slightly as well. So the front will have a strut brace. And I haven't designed that yet because I haven't fitted all the hardware in the engine bay. So I'll use the same three um, holes in the strut turrets to pick the strut brace up and to bolt these on as well. It's similar to what they've done in all the Group A stuff. And then strut brace on the back will go straight across the two top suspension uh -huh. uh, shock Twins, mounts. The, yeah, yeah the shock mounts. So the plan with that is to make some aluminium, billet aluminium uh, ends, and then I'll, I'll probably design a carbon fiber strut brace that goes across mm -hmm. the two and just, and, and, and build one of them, I'll make one of them. But, um, so that's why these haven't been fitted yet. Um, and the other thing, I've got to figure out the anti-roll bars as well. Cause it's so you've gone for bladed anti-roll bars? Bladed anti-roll bars. And these are the standard mounts that bolt to the shell for the compression strut that goes in there. And then obviously these, these running these nylon bushes there. Uh, they're the lower tr control arms as well. And the reason I haven't fitted these is because with putting the DCT gearbox on, it hangs slightly lower mm -hmm. and I need to pull these off the body shell slightly. And the other thing is when Ford made these body shells that the plate that the anti-roll bar bushes go on, they're not very accurate, which is fine when you've got a compliant rubber bush because mm -hmm. you just bolt things up. But when it's a stiff bar that needs to run in like a bearing, it's got to be absolutely perfect so that it moves because roll bar needs that to transmit torque across um, left and right of the car. So I need to get these absolutely spot on so I get perfect alignment across the car. And I also want to drop them slightly. So I'll make an adapter plate that picks up the standard mounts, then picks up these, but any kind of angle correction that I need to do, I'll build into the mount. So right. that I just, it just bolts up and then it's all kind of all lined up. And I'll do that using Faro Arm um, 3D design CAD and I'll model that in CAD and then I'll make these. Um, the other option is I'll make a set of brand new um, mounting blocks Mounts. that are slightly different.
The group here too and quite a lot won't have even gone to this extent, will they? When they were fitted, um, the bladed anti wall bars. Well, what they what they used to do um, was fit these on, but then they used to weld, used to weld a new plate onto the body shell, and right. by welding the new plate onto the body shell, you can actually do that slight bit of correction. Oh, right. Before you weld it on, mm -hmm. so they they'll have come across this and um, and corrected that by doing that. But I don't want to do that on, mm -hmm. on this on this shell. Like I say, I want to not modify the shell at all if I can help it so the only things I've had to do on that I might have to drill six holes in the strut tops for for these but that is to serve two purposes one to mount the suspension but other for the strut brace that it needs and the only other holes I've had to drill in the shell are for this second air box um, because oh, in, the, in the wings yeah and there's uh, there's three holes on the near side UK near side rear wing that has had to had to drill for that because those are 3d 3d printed air boxes based off the original um, they look mega they, have, they look like original air boxes as well well i've always wanted to go that oem look so it's, i would go with the oem you know, look it, it's not I, worth changing is it it's no, so it looks right uh -huh, it in, my, in my view it looks right uh -huh. and you know there's people can build cars but they're very obviously modified uh -huh. and i've got absolutely nothing wrong with that some of the cars that i've seen recently and that the, that that um sierra that was at the sema show Oh yeah, with a two point three eco boost, mm -hmm. fantastic car. Mm -hmm. You know, fantastic. The amount of work that's gone into that, and it's until you've actually built cars, you appreciate the amount of work that goes into stuff. They've done a real fantastic job on that, but that's very modified. It's mm -hmm. an obviously modified car. I don't want that. I mm -hmm. just want it to look unmodified, as if it's like a one of one that came out of Ford's showroom at some mm -hmm. point. You know, and I think that's kind of the you know the whole theme of the car. Um, because it's funny, you know, I can sit and look in this engine bay now and I can, you know, all of the work that's gone into it, I'm kind of like dumbing it down. You well, know, to hide your work? Well, to hide it, but it's, you know, it's all these like these air pipes and, and, and ducts from the turbo down into the intercoolers and stuff, it's specifically been done black. So it's not been done silver or bronze or mm -hmm. gold, so it stands out. It's... It's I would do that to be honest, mate. I would, I would have, I would have done them black so they, they yeah. don't stand yeah. out. But I remember you saying you had to modify. This is three yes. D printed. You had to do that because it was catching the bonnet. That's right, because throttle body there mm -hmm. usually bolts onto that plenum flange there, but obviously it would sit and then it would hit the underside of the bonnet. So that's a reposition elbow that's three D printed, um, but it looks like the original, the original. The original part. And then this part here, this elbow, which goes from the intercooler to the throttle body, that's 3D this bit print. This just down here. And then this is the, the blow-off valve that bolts to it as well. And if you, it's maybe difficult to see, but there's two, there's two connections here off the blow-off valve mm -hmm. that go straight into two connections on the airbox. So right. it blows off into the airbox. Oh, right. So you don't end up with that, you know, because... Good for a modified car, and lots of people are, but I'm getting too old for that now. Yeah, what it? No, no, no. <laughs> so, um, so air boxes are 3D print. These cold air intake tubes are 3D print as well, because standard Cosies, they have a, a duct that goes into the bottom of the air box for cold air intake, goes through the filter, then it comes out of here, and then into the turbo. With these, it's exactly the opposite way around. So the cold air intake picks up a fourth some standard mounting points. Mm -hmm. So it comes through the grill at the front, into the both intakes, into the airbox, through the filter, and then down into the turbo inlet. If you just take one of them lids off. So you can see it comes in, and then this is a big void here. But because the 3D print parts, you can actually do loads of real cool stuff. So what I've done is put a flow straightener. This is like a velocity stack as they call them mm -hmm. you'll see these on inlets of carbs and stuff but its sole purpose is to straighten the airflow going into the turbocharger so it, it's a small enhancement but because it's 3d print well why not why why not do that you know mm -hmm. it's part and parcel of the design so you know these were they're just they're just like a standard that's, that looks nice for 3D print as well. Mine's normally quite. Yeah, well, it's um, it's selected laser sintering, so it's not like um, uh, a 3D printer that uses a filament. Right. What it does is it uses powder, 
uh, and then a laser then melts the powder together. Right, the two that so were metal as well now. Yeah, they do that. exactly the 3D print parts in metal. But it's called sintering, laser sintering. Right. So that's why they look very different. Mm -hmm. Nicer finish, like a bit, yeah, bit yeah. more OEM looking. Yeah, but more like a cast, like a. You've got to paint them wound. or you've got to finish them um, because they normally come white. Um, right. You can get them dyed. Was this um, white originally then? Yeah, yeah, they were all white parts, looked like, you know, uh, underside of a sink when it <laughs> all came. But, um, but no, they've all been painted, but you just use, um, you know, a, a really good quality paint and it basically just absorbs it. And what the paint does, it seals them as well. So if there's any small voids in there, especially air box or when you're metering air into an engine, the paint actually seals the part as well. So, um, so they're all 3D print parts. The only other bit that I'm still waiting on is the new um, air conditioning unit that goes in the standard um, place in the middle the there. goes, yeah. So it's going to run air con, but again, um, when Ford fitted air con on the sapphires um, and the escort causes, they took that bulkhead panel out there. So uh -huh. they cut that out and put the uh, air con evaporator coil on instant, which it behind kind the of pours in a bit, doesn't it? It does, yeah. But I don't want to do that, obviously. Right. So um, what I've managed to do is, it's a tight space. He's managed to get a, an evaporator coil of a certain size because you need a certain amount of uh, heat capability to produce the amount of cooling for a cockpit of that size um, and fit a fan and actually p position it on the original mounts. So it'll use the stock heater matrix on the inside of the car, but the air con part is outside of the car. And the reason for that also is you get lots of condensation on the air con uh, evaporator that's why you have drains and I didn't want to put drains in the car mm -hmm. I wanted the drains in the engine bay so they run to the outside of the car so um, that's that's designed it just needs 3d printing I'll get that done in the new year and then that's another component that's on the car so there'll be things like the fan needs a power supply pressure switch for the uh, gas pressure um, what else will it need and then some of the controls to uh, energize the AC, because it have to see things like engine running, uh, clutch pressure, uh, all those types of things. Uh, AC compressor clutch pressure, should I say. Oh, it's got, all oh, right, yeah. yeah. Um, just, to, just for it to fire up and start up. And obviously the, um, the actual controller needs to be um, down at uh, fully cold and not fully hot. So there's loads of little micro switches and stuff like that that you need to build into the control Amazing. circuit. Absolutely incredible. <clears throat> it's all in here. Um, it's just, you've got to do things in a sim systematic way mm -hmm. um, because otherwise you just get lost, totally lost in it. And you end up with thousand things going on at any one time and never th and things never get finished right. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, we're not a million miles away, like I say, getting some <clears throat> some Amazing. wires on that and getting the control system and getting some power into the chassis and yeah, Five. start to come alive a little bit then, you know. Can we put it up, Steve, and have a look yeah. underneath? Yeah, yeah. Mate, this looks absolutely incredible. So this was a, obviously a brand new shell, but the, yeah. the quality. Yeah, it's, um, I asked the guys at the FC to to do it all in the proper or dub grey. Uh -huh. So it all looks original. So it all looks original. It's got the proper overspray in the right places. Yeah, exactly, and exactly that, yeah. And it's, you know, some people think, well, why, why? But I don't know. If you're doing why, it, you might why, as well not? do it the way you want it. So things, you know, looking from the back, obviously fuel tank still to go in. And the reason nah. the tank hasn't been done is I've got to modify the tank because I need to, um, it's going to run an in-tank system. So the fuel pump needs to be put in the tank. Like a uh, escort cause with fuel. Yeah, as similar opposed, to that. So um, I'll have the, on a normal cause with yeah, the, exactly. the fuel pump and fuel yeah. filter hang there. No, it's that, that won't be there. So the only pipe work will be coming out of the, out of the fuel pump and it will have a return because it's uh, it'll run fuel on demand so right. it's basically the, what the EcoBoost does and in fact most modern cars do now is they control the speed of the pump to control the fuel flow but also the fuel pressure and they have pressure sensors in the fuel rails on the engine so um, I know that the uh, the direct injectors have their own fuel pump and the whole fuel, their own fuel pressure but the port injectors need 58 psi Mm -hmm. So um, the way that the monitor and control that is by the speed of the pump, called pulse width modulation. So, um, and you don't then need to circulate a load of uh, fuel around the car. You just got the fuel coming out of the pump to the engine uh, at, the, at the volume that the engine's demanding at any time. 
So it'll just be a single fuel pipe going to the front. And then there's obviously the brake lines to run in. But yeah, about this rear beam. Now this isn't, there's a slight modification to this beam that the Group A cars ran. And that is these compliant bushes. Right. Um, because they used to rigidly mount these beams to the chassis. Uh -huh. And I think the car's still going to need some compliance, suspension compliance building into it. But I'll deal with that at, once it's up and running. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, it's gonna, there's going to be a lot of road noise getting transmitted into the shell. There's ways and means of dealing with that. Um, but for now, it's just a case of get the thing on, get the geometry set, get things built, get things proven, and then come back and revisit it. But one of the things I wanted to do, or which is um, you can't undo, is they usually weld uh, plates into there so that where the bush presses in, to just weld up and then they put an insert into one. Who does the Group A cars? Yeah, or the, you, know, if, you know, if the Group A cars that Paul builds, for example, they'll have inserts welding into them right. and then they'll just get bolted directly that to the shell. Because the, these guys aren't bothered. They want as much rigidity in the car as, mm -hmm. as they can. And then they also have a, a pickup point under here that the, the, the roll cage then bolts to as well mm -hmm. inside the car. Obviously, this doesn't have a, have a roll cage. So it's a slight modified, um, but more of a road going compliance. But everything else is the same. So the same um, rear beams, aluminium rear beams. And like I say, these toe links here, when I'm talking about the, the standard trailing arms, they're a, they're a lot more inboard. In fact, they're, they're more inboard than the actual body shell, whereas the trailing arms come out, and that's why you can't get a wide tyre or a wide wheel on there. So having these toe links inboard, you can actually get the width of the tyre now on the inside, and then the, the tightest point is on the spring. But, you, you know, you can change diameters of springs if you wanted to, as long as you get the, the poundage right. So you can maximise as much width for the wheel um, using this setup than, um, you know, if you use the standard setup. It's running a standard seven and a half inch diff. I know it's a standard diff. Yeah, I've had a lot of people saying it'll turn it into, uh, it'll lunch itself, but mm -hmm. it, if it does, it does. But, you know, it's it's running a Quaif ATB. It was built by Barra, Barra Motorsport. So it's like, it's not gonna be able to get any better mm -hmm. than using the right people and the right equipment. There's a lot of people who run Mark, is it Mark III? Super rear yeah. diffs? Did the you ever think of going something like that? I did. That? I just, do, you know, do you know why I didn't go that? I don't like the look of them. Is that what it was? Yeah. They, they are bigger and a lot mm. more. They look totally different. The, the other option is just put a nine inch mm -hmm. in, you know, group A nine inch, but yeah, you're into a lot of money and you've got to modify a few bits up here. Um, the other option is to, because I'm using the M3 gearboxes to put a BMW diff in, I think they run a. I think they're an eight inch crown wheel, so mm -hmm. it's supposed to be a bit more beefier. But again, I know I can I can dial the torque numbers in from the using the, the control software in the ECU. So I can limit the thing if need be. And I think my personal opinion is, you know, the reason diffs destroy themselves is people drive them too hard. Mm -hmm. And the launch and the dump the clutch and the you know, all this type of stuff, it's that shock loading that kills mm -hmm. them. So it's like, you know, I'm still going to enjoy driving it, don't get me no, wrong, I, but you've got to be a bit sympathetic at times. And as it's well. not like you're going to do a million miles in a tub. No, no. If it does a diff every five years, it's not <laughs> really a big <laughs> issue, is it? You, you know, you know it works. You go out for a cup of coffee with your mates, uh, though, you, you talk nonsense for an hour and drive it back home. But, um, so yeah, so a standard, standard rear diff, that was, like I say, fully rebuilt, um, so new bearings. It's got a 3.3 uh, pinion. Uh, ratio in there as well to match the seven speed DCT. So, so the gearbox. And one thing, Steve, are yeah. you worried about how far this is down? Or is that no? Because to be honest with you, they run a bit ass up these cars anyway. Mm -hmm. So the actual ground clearance at the bottom, at, at the back, is not 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 a problem. The ground, if anything, the ground clearance um, is here, but it's not that bad when you actually look at a standard car when mm -hmm. you get an exhaust on a standard car they're a lot lower than this mm -hmm. and my exhaust is going to be a lot higher and we'll talk about that in a moment but this is probably the lowest part of the car but that's why the sump pan is um is this your bullet sump pan yeah um well it's even got your rsr thing on there yeah so um I, everything's been like i say shrunk um height wise to get 
under the car, um, but everything's been tucked up. But again, don't run silly ride heights, mm -hmm. run a reasonable ride height. And just, yeah, just look out and just be careful when you're going over speed bumps and stuff like that. But there'll be a, there'll be a full under tray on this get put, put in, you know, whether it's a titanium skid or something. But it'll bolt to the, uh, which is why I haven't powder cut it this yet, because there's that still to fit. This plastic sump panel get changed for a billet one. Right, can you buy those? Y yeah, there's companies make these now for these. Because this um, is like, we see here, this is the M3 gearbox? Yeah, so this is the DCT. So all the mechatronics is in there, at the side of it. Um, so all of this needs heat shielding. So again, this is why the powertrain is fitted to the car. So I can see where to put heat shielding and what needs doing. Um, but also, you know, I need to start running the exhaust down from the, from the manifold. So all these bits have been made up. Um, I need to run the system in now. But one thing I don't like is this standard rear um, BMW rear, rear mount. So I'm going to change that to a, a different one. And they're going to make something yourself. Yeah, well, what I did, if you look at on here, this is an adapter, uh, oh, adapter right. bracket uh -huh. that makes it that gearbox fit this chassis. Mm -hmm. But these spacers here were all made when I was setting the engine pitch up. So mm -hmm. I could change these spacers. I made everything adjustable so I could get the flange angles from the output of the gearbox to the input of the diff absolutely right because if you're going to get valve train uh, valve train if you're going to get drive train vibration it's because your angles aren't right mm -hmm. and you'll probably find lots of uh, owners of old cars think the tires are out of balance and stuff it isn't it's because all bushes wear and everything starts to go out a kilter and you get valve uh, drive train vibrations mm -hmm. whereas if you get things right and you can put uh, put them all back straight it'll it'll run like a swiss watch so I made everything adjustable so I could get the angles absolutely spot on. So now I've got the right height to get the pitch right. Were well, you just adjusting the pitch with these? Yeah, I just or changed just the size of them. Change yeah. the, the, the yeah, height? Yeah, half a mil, one millimetre, whatever it needed. So now I know where it needs to be, I can change this. And the other reason is, if you look where the exhausts are coming, ideally, they want to run right in here, and they're right in the way there. Oh, right, uh -huh. So I'll probably make something a bit cuter um, to get rid of this big aluminium casting because I want to keep these exhausts tucked up in here. Um, obviously you've got your centre bearing for your, your the prop top. shaft there, but I'll put an X-pipe system in so I'll run it and use, use it for noise cancelling more than anything. Are you just going to use the standard Sierra prop? Don't air? Yeah, it's, um, it's on there is the prop. I can have a look at that in a mm -hmm. minute. Um, and then use two standard muffler boxes in there, but I'll probably put exhaust cutouts in there as well so that it can bypass these mufflers um, in certain drive modes so it gives it a little bit more of a throaty noise, shall mm -hmm. we say. Um, and what you'll find now is a lot of cars, when you first fire them up, they have bypasses in exhaust so they start noisy and then and quieten down. Quiet down. So that's kind of what that will do. And again, that's why I'll use a PDM system so I can design and that control logic in there. And then uh, obviously the other outlets from there will just come into like a standard system and then there'll just be a single, a single outlet at the back here, but it'll be uh, probably three and a half inch, something like that, coming out the back. Wouldn't standard handbrake cable, I'm guessing? I'm going to put electronic handbrakes oh, yeah. on it, yeah. yeah. What are you going to do for brakes? Are you going to go like some nice APs or something or...? Yeah, I originally bought some APs. Did you? Um, I've still got them, um, but they're at home, but they're, I might change them. I haven't decided yet. Right. I'll still go with AP, but the, the four pot all round, so a four pot on the front, four pot on the rear, I think the 330 and 360s on the front. But the reason I haven't committed to fitting them yet is because I've not finalised the design of the wheel. Right. So I want to design the wheel and the brake set up at the same time so that I know I can maximise the amount of uh, brake disc diameter and caliper I can get in the wheel um, before I commit. So still to be decided, but it will be, you know, upgraded brakes without a doubt. Mm -hmm. But the other thing I need to then sort out is wheel speed sensors. Um, where do you fit them? It's off your speed or? It's for all and, uh, of the powertrain control, control and the traction control because when you're running DCTs, you know, one thing that's absolutely critical is wheel speeds or vehicle speed because 
the car uses that signal for just about everything. Does it really? Yeah, yeah, so you have to get them right. And if you're using the BMW setup, um, they, have a, they have like a, a passive sensor and the actual triggers are um, north-south polarized like a magnet. Mm -hmm. So it knows which way the wheel's turning. Whereas a lot of active sensors are just like on a tooth wheel. So it just knows how to, when, it, when a tooth wheel passes, it pulses. Mm -hmm. On the BMW setup, it knows whether it's going north, south, north, north, south, or south, north, south, north. Right, so it knows folds backwards. Way. Yeah, so that's a bit of a tricky thing to get old because you've got to then adapt a BMW part into a standard drive shaft, say at the back and then the same at the front, you know, on a hub or something like that. So there's a few things I need to just get sorted on that. But the actual control logic for the DCT, the actual control code, um, I've got that now, so that's been done. So I know I can fire this engine up, which is why I wanted to get it running first, because I'll run that engine on the stand with the Cyvex ECU as well, so that when I come to plug the engine in here on the car, the engine will fire up and it'll run safe, and I can then go straight onto the transmission calibration then, rather than trying to do two things at once, because it's never, never easy when you do stuff like that. So, yeah, under sideways, um, you know, the main hardware, it's not fully bolted in yet. There's still quite a bit to do, uh -huh. but it's on, it's in place. It allows me to get, you know, on with other bits and pieces as well. Um, yeah, it's, it's absolutely amazing. You're, ab you're a cleverer man than me. <laughs> you're a cleverer man than me. You've got to figure it out. Well, if you start, you've got to see it through, but... Yeah, so yeah. what we got under here... Um, so these are the billet engine mount plates. Oh, right, aren't they? Um, both are different on each side. Do you design the engine mount and sub it out to be machined? No, I made those in you house. You made though. those? Um, because they're, they're not a fancy uh, geometry, mm -hmm. uh, what call You can do them in two and a half axis on a, on a CNC mill quite easily. Um, and these are upgraded engine mounts that um, you know you can buy off, off, the, off the internet. And then this, this beam, is different, but it keeps all of the same geometry mm -hmm. as the standard Ford beam. Is it so, lighter than the standard Ford? Beam? No, it's quite, it's quite, it's quite stiff. But again, you know, when you look at the design of a body shell, you think it's just the shell that gives it its rigidity. It isn't. It's the component parts mm -hmm. that bolt to it. Everything that bolts together. So that is a structural member, that, in my view. You mm -hmm. know, it's tying these chassis legs together. Uh -huh. So you know, if you can upgrade it, upgrade it. Mm -hmm. So when you, you're talking about strut braces. At the you know, earlier on is having a, a, a pretty rigid cross member and a, a rigid strut brace at the top, that'll stiffen the front up. Mm -hmm. um, lots of companies or lots of, um, certainly American companies, they have what they call frame rail connectors as well. And they connect like these, these unibodies as they call them, they connect these frame rails, you know, to the rear axle as well with like a, um, a an bar. slung system. You know, the old Mustangs used to have them and Camaros and all that type of stuff. So there might be something in in this as well. I haven't quite figured it out yet because there's plenty of ground clearance to do it when you consider where this is sat. It's to maybe put some um, an underslung frame system underneath it as well to tie the front to the rear, to stiffen it up front to rear. But Did we'll you see. never think of running a roll cage then? No, I didn't want to do that. No, no. I always knew it was going to be a bit of a compromise. Mm -hmm. but, um, so what else is under here? Um, yeah, yeah, standard standard rack or some running electric. Sierra rack. Yeah, it's running electric power steering. Again, it's adjustable. So, so with you running the Sierra power steering runs hydraulic. It Are does. you not going to run any hydraulics? No, running. Um, it's an E-Pass system, electric power assisted steering. We can have a look at that when we drop the car down. So you're going to put a standard, like not a cause with power steering rack. You're going for non. No, so I'll use this. It'll use this manual rack. Uh -huh. um, I'll use this body, but I've got a, um, a high ratio um, pinion and, and, and shaft to put in this because I think standard Sierra Sierras that we used to run had something like four and a half turns lock to lock or mm -hmm. something. It was ridiculously high, where I think causes are like two point something. Two so, point four. So yeah. So I've, I've got the ratio the same, um, and. The thing with this rack is um, if you change, the rack is apt to move down 
from a standard position because yeah. of because of the sump. And when you move the rack down, what you do is you change the angle of the steering arms mm -hmm. to where the track control arm angle is. And that's where you end up with bump steer. Mm -hmm. Now, again, going to the Group A setup, I can dial all that out because I can shim underneath the uprights to where the uh, steering arms go. All right. So I can, I can shim it there, dial it out there. But I've also put these spaces in here at the moment it's as high up as it will go mm -hmm. and you can see it's pretty tight up against the sump so i'm going to drop this down but i'll just keep it in the utmost position at the moment and then just change the spaces of the rack and then change the spaces at the end to be able to get the steering geometry right because i know the tcas are in the standard position to mm -hmm. what they were so there's a that's why everything's kind of fully adjustable um to be able to do all of that stuff and and have that in mind you know, so when we do get the wheels on and we get it sat on its springs and its ride height and everything, we can then, we've got a fully adjustable setup that we can get it absolutely spot on for good handling on the road. Um, so, with yeah, regards to, with, sorry, with regards to mm. wheels, are you going with like a touring car style wheel, like a, a split rim with a big centre lock and wheel nut? There'll definitely be centre lock wheel nuts, but I'll use it, I'm going to go monoblock. What mono block means? Just Not a single piece. Ones. Yeah, uh -huh. a single piece. But um, you know, if you, the standard three door wheel is supposed to replicate a centre lock. You know, with mm -hmm. the with the with the cover with the on, with the little tiny nut on there. It's always been too small. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to make. I'll send you some photos. Actually, I've already done the design. I'm going to make a 17 inch centre lock that looks like the original road car wheel. Right but it's got a proper nut in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what it'll look like. But because I'm going slightly wider, I'm gonna play with it because the, the standard wheels, um, because they're designed a set of 17s, they're very flat where mm -hmm. the spokes are. And I think these could do with a very slight curvature mm -hmm. to them as well, because it'll give it a little bit more attitude, if you know what I mean, with a slightly different profile on the wheel. So I'm, I'm gonna play with the design maybe even over Christmas, New Year, when I'm sat bored watching TV or whatever, mm -hmm. and just play with the design slightly. Um, and once, once I've got the wheel aesthetics looking good, I'll, I'll get the suspension on, then I'll do a final scan of everything with a, with a laser scanner, and then put the 3D model into the laser scan, and then artificially move it through the full suspension travel and full steering angles to make sure that nothing hits or collides then I'll be happy with the design of the wheel and then they'll go into manufacture. So before you even get a wheel, you're going to know it's not going to catch, yeah. you're going to know where you've got clearance. Yeah, exactly that, yeah. Do yeah. all the computer, so the 3D design on your computer. You can optimise the offset. You can optimise the shape at the back of the wheel to get a big caliper on. Mm -hmm. Because lots of people struggle with offset and caliper clearance, um, which is why I've held off the brakes as well. Um, because you can get 3D models of any new calipers from AP or Brembo or whatever, um, and then you can build that 3D CAD model into your model to make sure you've got, you know, the two or three mil clearance or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of the next real stage is wheels and wheels and brakes, as well as the electrical wiring and stuff. But everything else is kind of fit and finish is getting there. Fit and finish, mate, is yeah. absolutely <coughs> incredible. Absolutely incredible. It's like better than brand new. I mean, mm. you're not purposely going for crunk horse, but it's no. not going to be far no. off, is it? No. No, the thing, thing with me, Adam, is if it's not right, I can't. I it will bug you. It really, really does bug me. Mm -hmm. And there's a few little things where, you, you, I don't know, you get to a point, whereas if, if you're not feeling it, put it down mm -hmm. and come back to it at another, another time. Day. Because if you don't, you end up ruining it or compromising on stuff. But things like, you know, these, these connectors here, the silicon connectors, mm -hmm. I hate silicon. Do you? Yeah, I don't know. So, what are like you going to do? I'll. Um, well, you, surely you must have, you must need something for movement yeah, when the do. engine moves. Exactly. But what I'll do is I'll get some OE looking silicon hoses. Right, I'm with you. you. Can, I'm you with don't you. have this shiny, horrible. Mm -hmm finish with the lines in and you got it yeah so you know so those are like the, the turbo outlets into the intercooler um and things like you know yeah i thought it was your radiator but it's not it's your no, intercooler, it's the intercooler. It? radiators there look uh -huh. so i had all this lot made by 
Pro Alloy. I've used Pro Alloy for years on projects. Really, really good quality stuff, and the guys down there are fantastic. But it uses all the standard um, mount radiator points. and the RS500 radiator mount, or uh -huh. intercooler mount. So the intercooler's on the RS500 mount, which is here. Radiator's on the standard mount. Um, so these are like, um, you know, turbo outlet pipe going into the intercooler, and it's a, it's a twin a twin cord intercooler that goes to a single outlet up into the throttle body and then the the inlets for the turbos are here and they connect to the bottom of the air box and things like this is why I put these on because these are air intake temperature sensors all oh, right now um, the engine doesn't need them to um, to run but I put them in because you can do in, in Cybex, you can build um, custom maps mm -hmm. and you can then do compensation for air intake temperature because air intake temperature obviously changes air density and changes um, you know, many, many other things. So you can actually use that reference signal for something. Mm -hmm. Daft as it sounds, even if it's to show outside air temperature on the dashboard at some point, it <laughs> might be, you, know, you can do all that type of stuff. So, um, yeah, so that's why they're on. Um, but I've had I made those parts pretty months ago, in fact years ago. <laughs> I was going to say, mate, it's yeah. honestly, I'm a, every every time I come down, this car absolutely just amazes me. Yeah, the fit, it. the finish, the, le the just the quality, everything, everything. Yeah. I'll be embarrassed to show you my car, <laughs> <laughs> mate. But and then FC um, lads as well have done an amazing job. Yeah, they have. Like I say, it's been on a full rotisserie uh -huh. kind of um, uh, paint job. You know, all the, like I say, the underside's been done all in the right, correct. Is this like, all new as well then? Like this, the same thing? Yeah, stuff. a lot of it is, but a lot of it was original as well. Uh -huh. There's certainly certain parts that were left alone, uh -huh. uh, but us and, and most of the other parts that were redone, just to give it that, you know, authentic look. OEM look. Yes, amazing. Absolutely amazing. So yeah, this, this engine will be in and out probably a couple of times. Uh -huh. you know, so when do you think you'll have it running? Because I mean, I, I know <laughs> the, the original timeline was a lot yeah. shorter and it's obviously I spiraled. The then, didn't I? Yeah. Um, I want it running next year. Do you think? Yeah, we're not far off next year now, are we? Next summer, do you think? You'll have a, do you think you'll have it out in the summer? No, I don't think we've, I don't think we've finished for summer, but no. it'll be running and hopefully sat on its wheels and drivable by then. Um, I've, you know, you get to a point with, with projects like this that you do loads of things and nothing changes. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, things start to come together. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of just getting to that stage now. You know, we're starting to think about running wires to stuff, putting fuel tanks in. Mm -hmm. You're not far off turning you know, the key. Turning the key and getting it to run. But, you know, the amount of time and the effort that goes into the design features uh, what take the time not actually fitting the parts you know because you've got to kind of think 10 steps ahead of yourself all of the time because mm -hmm. I hate doing things twice uh, this do one once do it right exactly that's why I do a lot of scanning and 3d modeling and stuff because you know uh, do it you know do it right so that you know in your, your own mind it's going to be right mm -hmm. And then it just kind of just all falls together and fits on nicely. Does this consume all the spare time in your head? Like if you're sitting doing nothing, are you yeah, thinking, a lot of it. I, I would say all of it, but certainly a lot of it. You know, I've still got a business to run as well. I've mm -hmm. still got other customers to keep happy um, on stuff. But as you can see, I don't do customers' cars anymore. No, it just takes so much time. I do lots of other things, mm -hmm. uh, powertrain development in particular. You know, different engine gearbox packages and stuff, but. But you, you know, I look at them as they're all learning curves as well. Uh -huh. You know, always learning doing stuff others can't do or haven't done. Um, you just get in to figure it out and, and work it out. Maybe I cannot wait stuff. to see this done. Just I can look inside and. <laughs> yeah. No, it's uh, it does take a lot of time. It must be oh god, three years. Is maybe? that what it's been? Three years. I bet it's maybe longer. Ah, but well. it has come a long way in that time. But oh. when, you're, when you're out doing it. Uh -huh all the time every day you know it's going to take time but and like you said like you see it's a project it's not work it is and it's changed you know it's changed you know i never intended to put that suspension uh -huh. on 
This is um, like your, your hobby, your spare time hobby kind of thing, isn't it? Well, it's, it's, it's my work, car, work. you know, it's not a customer's car, yeah. so um, it needs to be right, because like I say, if it isn't right, it'll end up getting sold the day I finish it. <laughs> and I don't want to do that. I want to be able to walk up to it and think, every single component or every bit of work I've done has been right. Um, and if I can achieve that, I'll be a happy man. Yeah, yeah. So, is that just a quarter rack? No, the thing that started, it's, it's DC Electronics. Um, they originally started, DC Electronics originally started with his microsteers using Corsa B's, Corsa mm -hmm. C stuff. Um, but they do their own stuff now, so all of these are all their own castings and things. So there, there's a separate controller for this. So obviously your main power supply for your motor there, and these are the control signals that, mm -hmm. that give it that um, amount of assistance. So with these, Again, going back to you, why do you use PDM and stuff and vehicle speed? Um, normally, the, the controller is just the potentiometer and you just change the pot to give the uh, assistance. Well, if you develop a custom map in Cybex, you can actually then output a reference voltage to this and the inputs to that custom map will be several things like steering angle, vehicle speed, and you can get it fully closed loop then. So this, the steering's constantly adjusting dependent on the driving conditions. So there's, there's quite a few things that I can do with that. But this, you know, where it mounts, um, again, just by 3D scanning, this, the body shell, um, having a 3D model of that, I was able to design that adapter piece that runs in there. And obviously the, the output shaft goes straight through the bulkhead and then it picks up on the standard rack but it clears all of the, the under tray, um, you know, the plastic under tray. Uh -huh. So the only thing I have to do, this collapsible piece here, um, I've got to design it. Is that in case of crash? It is, exactly that, yeah. Um, every steering system has to have a, a collapsible section. And when you put a, this in, the collapsible section, it's like a telescopic piece. Uh -huh is in this section of the rack. By putting that in, you've, you've made that rigid. So you've got to find somewhere else to put the collapsible section. So I'm, I've designed a system that goes inside this concertina piece there. So, you know, it's, uh, if you hit that steering wheel, it's got to be able to, to collapse a certain distance. Move out the way. Yeah. Otherwise, if you don't, you end up with a, a spear uh, pointing at your chest, you know. That's, the old cause. Exactly, and yeah, you know, I don't want that. No. Mm -hmm. So things like, you know, all standard switch gears going on. Um, I'll be putting things like, you know, uh, door switches mm -hmm. here and say everything with a, with a wire yeah. connector onto it, even all inside at doors and things, they all, they all need wiring in. And that's the actual engine harness coming through the bulkhead there, so that's where the ECU will pick up in the standard position behind the dash. So the Cybex will go behind there as well. And then, yeah, just start running wires. Amazing. And, uh, Amazing. Obviously, standard seats you were seeing, standard back seats. Yeah. Standard um, looking door, original looking door cards, but you're going to have them redone. Yeah, I'm going to... Um, hmm. the, the dash is probably the biggest challenge uh -huh. because you can't find them for loving the money. Right, well, um, not a good one, can you? You, you buy a good one for wrong. you buy a good one for a good money, then it cracks a wound for the. Well, for it's funny because there was a guy contacted me oh, a few months back. He said, "Oh, I know where there's a brand new one in a box," and mm -hmm. I'm like, "Okay, well, if they want to sell it, I'll buy it." You know, um, but it's the wrong colour because I'm going a different colour to the standard interior. Um, can we have a look at the standard interior in this so people can see the colour? Yeah. It's a bit of a... Uh, that grey, isn't it? It is, yeah. But again, this that has got a Mark II dash in. Um, and you can see how warped it is. And that's exactly ah, what you find. There. The bore. Yeah, so I've got two dashes over, over there that um, I'm going to look at remaking the dash. And I'm going to vinyl. I've got a vacuum machine that I've just purchased as well. So I'm going to vinyl wrap the dashes as well. So that... Um, I can make a dashboard of the right colour that isn't warped. And then um, what I'll do then is I'll start remaking door cards as well and rear quarters in the same colour. But 
this the pattern in the seats. I'll get the going to get this. I'm going to use standard Recaro. I think these are LS standard Recaro LS. Uh -huh. um, they're going to be the uh, Napa leather on the outsides, and then black Alcantara. But I'm going to store a swatch of this cut. This oh, I thought you were pattern. putting the original seats in. No, I'm going to go black with the seats. Oh, you're going to retrim them. Um, and like I say, a black um, black panelling. Alcantara panelling, uh -huh. and then I'll probably put a stripe of that material uh -huh. in it somewhere, and I'm going to carry that theme across into the door cards and the rear cards, so uh -huh. the rear quarter cards as well. And then the dash is going to be black, the headline is going to be black, carpet will be black. Um, You're going for LCD dash as well, but original looking? Yeah, so I've, I've actually designed, I designed that years ago I again as well. I remember. Um, so using a, a LCD display. Um, but replicating the analog controls look, look um, but in, in a digital format. And then, you know, I think silly things like when you power it up, it'll come up with like Ford Performance uh -huh. or, you know, RSR 500, and then the display will come up. But also what you can do is you can have the dash have different screens on. So you can scroll through the screens and you can also look at diagnostics. So you can... You know, if you want to look at gearbox temperature, for example, or clutch pressures and stuff, you can have a separate screen purely to, to oh, see what right. they are, because it's all on CAN bus. Mm -hmm. So all of that data is on the CAN, and once you find what the CAN address is, you can assign it to do whatever you want. So that's why, again, going right back to the start, scoping that engine and then knowing what the CAN addresses are on the DCT, and then configuring them so that I can display them and read them, I don't need a laptop on my knee, I can do it on the screen. Mm -hmm. So so that's the plan for that. It's either going to be there or in the centre console um, because I won't be putting the standard old Ford head unit in and amplifier. I'll probably make a panel or the display in there um, and I might put all of that sat nav or sync, Ford Sync 2 system in there as well and just reconfigure that so it's a little bit more modern looking. Mm -hmm. So this is going to take a long time to kind mm -hmm. of get done, which is why the car won't be done next year. Mm -hmm. it'll, be, it'll be driving and running, but this Not is going finished. to take an inordinate amount of time. And like just figuring out how to remake these dashboards is, um, is going to be a bit of a challenge, but you know. I imagine there's quite a market as well for the dashboards if you can, um, if you can Well, I'm, I'm of the opinion, Adam, if I, if I won't pay silly, silly money for stuff that's not right, Mm -hmm. I'd rather put money into designing and developing something to remake them mm -hmm. back to the original condition or the original kind of style. And then it gets what I want. And then if I can then, um, you know, offer that service to other people who are wanting to go that route, fine, I'll do that, you know. It just gets, gets, what, gets what I want and obviously offers something else back mm -hmm. into the community. That's it. You know, because, I don't know, there's... Bits for these are getting so difficult to find. So expensive And as so well. expensive. And for to be like honest, a Ford yeah. part as well, it's not even like it's a yeah. Lamborghini yeah. or an old Ferrari, it's just a, it's a Sierra. But it, the, the parts are not in very good condition no. either. No, You know, well, somebody like thinks we, great is not good. Like we're seeing, that these cars are 30 odd year old. Parts were never designed never. to last this kind of time. No, no like I say, dash, dashes, they're always, always a problem. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot yeah. of parts that were always a problem. Yeah. Like, like even like, I mean, these parts here. Uh, I've got a few. I've got a set of them. Fortunes? I've actually got two scuttles there that I was uh, just um, cleaning up. I'd, I'll just pick which is going to be the best one. But again, you can't find them new. No. But I think Paul's got a new set. Yeah, probably. Yeah. But, you know, I picked them up months back. And they're in good condition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in good condition. No cracks or no bits missing. Just one of them's got a mark on there, look, which that will probably be the deciding factor as to whether it goes on the car. It'll probably sort of It might somehow. come off, I don't know. It's maybe a bit of tape or something, but mm -hmm. this is probably the one on. Hold on, sorry. The one you lose. Yeah, so it just wants a bit of a clean. Bit of a buff. A bit of a buff, up. yeah. So, and then obviously, yeah, two end pieces. Mm -hmm. I'll, uh, I'll put that on. But it's, you know, it's a, it's a good enough part to, mm -hmm. to go on the car. Right, that's it, fellas. Thanks so much to Steve for letting us come down and have a look at these projects. This Sierra Cosworth is actually for sale. I'll leave Steve's contact information below if you're interested in the car. Um, very reasonable price. 
Everything effort as well, Steve, engine, gearbox. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a complete car. Um, and the thing about it is it's, it's original kind of untouched. You know, it's not mm -hmm. been messed about with. Um, it does no need some work though. Oh, it needs some work, yeah. You know, it's a tired car, but it's a perfect project car for somebody. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if it doesn't sell, I, you know, my viewers are, I'd, I'd restore it. Mm -hmm. I'd put it back to an original condition car because everything's there. Two mm -hmm. is still good. The dashboard, it was in the dashboard. I've got a second hand dash there that would be put into it or thrown in as well. Mm -hmm. But yeah, all the suspensions, all in, uh, all just been taken off purely to do the development. Um, I've got some new trailing arms for the back as well. Um, so there's, there's quite a few new parts with it as well. Um, engine's still good. Um, gearbox was still good. Just wants a good clean, mm -hmm. you know. If you're interested in the Sierra Cosworth, I'll leave Steve's information below. Steve also has a Facebook page, which I'll leave linked, where you can follow the, follow the development, the build of the RSR 500. Um, but yeah, again, mate, thanks for having us down. Thanks for right. taking the time out to show us around. No, you're welcome. Yeah, good to see you again. Mate. You as well, mate. Yeah. Thanks for watching, fellas, and I'll catch us on the next one. Cheers. Cheers.